So show, sure. how we feeling? Started things off a little bit differently tonight, but nonetheless all good. And it is always good to be here on a Tuesday with what God is doing in here. And it doesn't matter what has happened prior today. And it also doesn't matter what's happening to all your March Madness brackets right now. Right? <laughs> like it's, it's just craziness what is going on. It's a fun time to be alive inside of March Madness, watching the NCAA tournament. It is crazy. Even if you're not a basketball fan, you'd be entertained by it. But... In March Madness, I actually got very curious, and I was like, man, with this bracket challenge that goes on every year, surely, like, the odds aren't that bad to be able to come up with this perfect bracket, right? So I don't know if you've ever Googled it before or looked into it, but the odds of getting a perfect bracket, meaning in the NCAA tournament, you have to guess the correct outcome of all 63 games that happen in the NCAA tournament. The odds of it is 1 in 120.2 billion if you know something about basketball. They even said if you don't know anything about basketball and you're just doing a coin flip, it's 1 in 9 point something quintillion. I grew up in Cross County, Arkansas. They didn't teach a number with that many zeros behind it. But I know those odds aren't good, right? So sometimes I get in some wormholes and just get so fixated on things. So I also Googled, what are the odds of me achieving my childhood dream of reaching the NFL at 30 years old, data two, and I'm feeling it, right? What are those odds of me reaching the NFL? Strikingly enough, and there's a little bit of foreshadowing inside of that phrase, the odds are the same of getting to the NFL as it is to get struck by lightning once in your lifetime. Like no joke, literally they are around the same ballpark of making it to the NFL every year into the draft as you would get struck one time in your lifetime. Also, maybe some of y'all had the ambition of maybe going to the Ivy League school of Harvard. Any Harvard grads in here? Just thought I would ask. Okay, cool. Woo pig. State school, baby. Hey, the odds of getting into Harvard, odds of getting into Harvard, they are renowned for their rejection rate. They accept less than five applicants for every 100 applications that they get in. So their acceptance rate is around 4%. So here's the deal. These are all great, honorable places to achieve, to get into, to do. But then when we sit back and we think, man, if it's something else, if you have to be that good, that elite to get into a place like Harvard, to make it to the NFL, to get a perfect bracket, what does it take to get to a place like heaven, right? Like, What does it take to get to a place as perfect as heaven, this place of perfect peace, this place that is forever without sin, without harm, and just fully enjoying eternal life with God, our creator, our maker, our father. Like we can't wait to get there, but it just begs the question, man, like what, what does it take? And inside of this series of misconceptions, we're going to inspect another one tonight. And it's this common misconception that can influence many people's thinking that I'm good enough to get into heaven, that I can be good enough in and of myself, dependent upon me, dependent upon my good works, dependent upon my good deeds to get into heaven. So inside of this thought, there are many religions that this is the root of it. You become the best person that you can be, be as moral of a person, you continue to grow, and you be good enough to get into heaven. Your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, and you get into heaven. Even inside of Christianity, this can be a struggle for us that we wrestle with to where we start to be influenced in our living by living according to this thought that I've got to live to be good enough to be accepted by God and get into heaven. This thought is so trivial, so common. However, it can greatly influence and impact our life and our relationship with God. And we really need to dive in and just see why this is a misconception and what God's word has to say about it. Because this misconception, if we lean into it, 
we are going to misunderstand our true position before God without Jesus, which is a dangerous place to be. We're going to miss out on truly understanding God's love and why Jesus came. And we'll misuse our purpose in life. We'll miss out on what our purpose in life really is and the fullness of what it is. But through the journey tonight, thankfully we are going to see a different case. Thankfully we're going to see that this is a complete falsehood that we do not have to be good enough. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and turn in scripture there, it will be up on the screens as well. Or you can turn to it on your phones. But Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And tonight, we're going to see three reasons why this is false. Three reasons that I, I can be good enough to get into heaven, to be accepted by God. We're going to see that, one, we can't be good enough. It's just, it's not an ability of ours. We're not capable of it. We don't have to be good enough. It's not what God's word really says. And then thirdly, we shouldn't aim to be good enough. The motivation with which we live life shouldn't be about being good enough. But yet there is a deeper, more resonating, fulfilling purpose that we can have in our life because of what God's word says. So the first reason that I can't be good enough to get into heaven is that we can't be good enough since we're already dead. Are you glad you came to church tonight? Right? <laughs> Real encouraging right out of the jump. I promise it gets better. But we have to start here. This is a core understanding of the gospel that we lean into and we have to accept and recognize and hold as true. But we can't be good enough since we're already dead. And if you're mad at me for saying that, I had to come to grips with that as well. But also, don't shoot the messenger. Paul said it about 2,000 years ago, okay? So we're going to look at his words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by God in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And it says this. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like all of mankind." So as I said, there's this apostle named Paul who is writing this letter to the church at Ephesus. And in this letter, uh, excuse me, in Paul's life, at one time, his ambition was what we're talking about tonight, what we're trying to disprove tonight. His ambition was trying to be the best Jew that you could possibly be. His ambition was to be so zealous in all of the good works and keeping all the laws so that he may look pristine and clean before God. Paul, before he met Jesus, he would have even really reckoned with and stood on this misconception. You can even look at his testimony. We won't turn there tonight, but if you wanted to look at just Paul's testimony, Philippians chapter 3 records what Paul was seeking, how Paul was seeking after God and how he thought he should be accepted by God. But what he pins here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, after he was changed by Jesus, uh, Jesus' love, tells a different story. It tells a different aspect. It's not saying here that we have to strive to be good enough in order to be accepted into heaven. Ultimately, he says, as I said before, and the main reason tonight, that we are dead. We're dead. We're not behind the eight ball. We're not behind. We, we're not, we don't have to catch up. We're dead. And what he's meaning here is like spiritually our soul, there's no life in it. It's destitute. It's lifeless. There's, there's no hope in and of ourself to be able to attain such a high standing as the acceptance of God and heaven. We're dead. Well, why are we dead? We're dead because of our sinful nature. 
He says, you're dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You followed the course of this world. You followed the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived, carrying out the passions of our flesh, the desires of our mind. And were by nature children of wrath like all of mankind. He's saying, man, we're dead because we have a sinful nature. Paul uses this word flesh here, or in the Greek, sarks. I know that's a really churchy word, right? You're like, why are we talking about flesh? It just sounds weird, right? Can we just all be honest? It's just a really weird sounding word. I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like the way it sounds. But what he's meaning by flesh here is not our physical skin. What he's meaning by flesh here is our, is our human nature that is devoid of any divine influence. What he's saying is that when we are born into this world physically, we are also, we're we're spiritually dead because of sin. Because of the sin nature into this world that entered into humanity with Adam and Eve. We're broken. We're separated from God because of our sinful nature. It's why each and every one of us can really understand that at the end of the day, the past, all the differences, we're all cut from the same cloth. So what Paul says, he says, Hey, all of mankind, everybody is sinful, is dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Everyone understands what it means to just not be good enough, to feel that weight, to feel the weight of a mistake that you make. Or as Paul would put it, sin in your life. We all feel that. So Paul is saying here, we can't be good enough Since we're already dead. He's saying, I had it all wrong. I was kidding myself in my ambition, in my zealousness. I was kidding myself that I could be good enough to to fit the perfect standard that God had for me. I was kidding myself. I am dead in my sins, in my trespasses. And this comes off pretty harsh. Honestly, this is, this is a tough thing to wrestle with. This is why many people get frustrated with the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is offensive in this. But the gospel tells us the truth. The gospel lets us know exactly where we are, right where we're at without Jesus. So we have an accurate understanding of a starting point. To not trick ourselves and to think that we can go to such a perfect place as heaven when we all know we have imperfections in our life. How do we reckon with those? Is it really just weighing both out and seeing if good outweighs the bad? And like, well, how much does that take? And the gospel is just straight with it. He says, it's not about that at all. You're all dead. We're all dead. We all feel the weight of our brokenness. Romans 6.23 would say it this way. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. For the wages of sin is death. Where sin gets us, it's death. It's nothing. It's separation. But the gift of God in his eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Which leads us to our second truth tonight. Our second reason why I can't be good enough to get into heaven. It's this, we don't need to be good enough for God's love and acceptance. So even though I can't be good enough because I'm already dead in my sin, I'm born into a sinful nature, God says, you don't have to be. God says, you don't have to be good enough for my love and my acceptance. Here's how Paul continues in Ephesians 2, verse 4 through 7. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Not only that. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We don't need to be good enough for God's love and acceptance. Paul writes here that our God does not define a relationship with us nor our acceptance into heaven based upon our merit, based upon our performance, based upon our good deeds. Why? Because he says, but God, being rich in mercy, uh, excuse me, being rich in mercy because of the great love that he had for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together in Christ, even though we were already dead and couldn't be good enough. God loved us enough anyways. Our, def- our, our, our The defining relationship with God is based on his love and is based on his character and is based on what he did, not who we are and what we've done. But that his love goes further than anywhere we could ever get ourselves in sin. God's grace and mercy and love is not won over by how good of people we are. It's based on how good of a heavenly father he is, even when we don't deserve that. And I know that there may be several different, several different dynamics or perspectives of relationships that gets this skewed in our mind, right? You may have some relationship that you're close to to where it just feels like you're never good enough for that person. There's this standard that you just can't meet in their life. Whether that may be a parent, whether that may be a coach that you've had in your past, a boss, a friend maybe. We all maybe in some way, shape, or form have just felt that weight of like, but I just don't feel totally accepted by them. I just feel like I'm not good enough to some extent. Me growing up in sports, I had a lot of different coaches, and I would say most of them were, were pretty great. There were some that that would definitely be how I would characterize them, that it was just basically how good of a football player I could be for them. Not a basketball player because I wasn't about that sport, okay? But how good of a football player I could be. And I mean, y'all, football was my life. Like, I was the stereotypical boy raised in a small farm town. Like, I just, I wanted to play underneath the Friday Night Lights my entire life. It was my love. I was born into it. Like, my dad was an All-American linebacker at Arkansas State. And I mean, I just, I I was born on Super Bowl Sunday. Like, I was just, I was made to love football. This was my love. This was my passion. I wanted to be the best football player that I ever could. There were even times where during the offseason after practice or after lifting weights, I would go to this like six-week running program to just try to get faster because I wasn't that fast. But they like promised, hey, we'll take two tenths off your 40 time. And they did. I went from a 5'4 to a 5'2. It's not that great if you don't know 40 times, right? But I, I did everything I could to become the best football player that I possibly could be. I put everything in it, so much work, so much performance into it. And when I got to high school, our senior year, we were finally good. We had a winning record like halfway through the year. Like we were number two in our division of the conference, and we were playing the state game of the week. We were playing against Batesville, and they had rolled over everybody so far by like 20, 30 points, and they're coming to our stadium. And we'd be like, nah, uh not here. And so it gets down into the fourth quarter, the defining moment of the game. And this is the state game of the week. Like, this is a big deal. Winner of this could be the winner of the whole conference if everything played out great. And with less than two minutes left, I get the call. And I'll just roll the clip and show you what happened next. And let's see what Batesville can do here. Wynn's going to milk everything that they can. They're not going to have to snap the ball until inside of a minute. Let's see what the defense can do. Handoff goes to the left. Ball rolls on the ground. Batesville's going to pick it up. He could go. He could go. Go, Matthew. Go, Matthew. Go. Go, Matthew. Go. Oh, Matthew's going to go. He's going to score. Touchdown, Matthew Showalter. Touchdown, Matthew Showalter. Touchdown, Matthew Showalter. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Woo-hoo. And there ain't no flag. No penalty flag. 
We can, we can cut it. We're good. We're good. Thanks. Appreciate it. Ain't no flags, man. There's false start, you know. But anyways, besides my bitterness, y'all, this, this wasn't just like the worst moment of my high school career. Like, I mean, I wanted to hang up the pads after this. But like, it caught fire on YouTube. It's off, like this is on there now with about 10,000 views. The original one had 300,000 views. And Sports Center picked it up. And it got shown on Sports Center on Monday. And like everybody I talked to, wherever I went, whether it's a church camp or whatever, like they brought up, when I told them I was from when, they brought, oh, dude, did you know that guy? I was like, yeah, I know him pretty well, <laughs> right? But here I was in that moment, like had worked my entire life, had put in all the effort, all the work for this moment. It's like two yards. I can do this. I can put this in. And yeah, I literally fumbled the ball on the ground, and they take it 98 yards, and I never want to say Matthew Showalter in my life, right? Um, just kidding. Love them. Love your enemies. Uh, but I had my coach, Coach Singleton. And, y'all, I was distraught. I was empty. I'm like, I, I, like, this is what it leads to? And my coach came over to me and, like, without saying a word, just, like, wrapped his arms around me and just sat there with me. Didn't say a thing. He just sat there in that moment. And he just cared on me. He didn't care about my performance. He didn't care about the fumble. And by the way, that was the only fumble that I had since seventh grade, but I digress. <laughs> but he didn't care about any of that. He just cared about me. He loved me enough to put the performance aside, see me in just my devastation and desperation of this moment that meant everything to me, and just come and embrace me. And that's just a small, small glimpse of how God runs after us in our sin. Even though we're dead in our trespasses, even though we make mistakes, even though you know, we know we've screwed up, we feel that weight of imperfection. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has for us. Even though we were dead in our sin, made us alive together in Christ. So many of you walked in here tonight with all kinds of lives going on. All kinds of lives. But we all feel that weight of a decision, of an action, of a sin in our life, of just hanging over our head. Of just feeling that shortness of, I don't really think I'll ever be good enough. And for God in heaven, I just... I don't know. I don't know if God, I don't know if I'm able to be forgiven of this. I don't know if I'll ever get past this. But God says, even when we were dead in our sin, because He's rich in mercy and loves us so greatly, He makes us alive together in Christ. Because we have a heavenly Father who does not define our relationship based off of merit. We have a heavenly Father that defines our relationship based off of His love grace and mercy alone. And you never have to wonder where you stand with a God like that. That's the life-changing love that we talk about here at church. That's why we praise Jesus' name every single week. Because through Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sins, he did what we could never be good enough to do. He did what we needed. He did the only thing that could save us. He took our punishment and tasted death that he should have never deserved and spilled his innocent, perfect, precious life to be able to pay that punishment in debt and wipe the slate clean, to take all the red out of our ledger. Not for anything you've done or I've done or anybody else, but Jesus. We don't have to be good enough for God's love and acceptance because Jesus was. So wherever you're at tonight, whatever it is that's making you feel just less than, no, that's sinful nature. It's 
brokenness. But you can be made alive together in Jesus Christ. Be thankful that God is a father of redeeming love. Be thankful that that is how he defines our relationship with him. 1 John 4.10 would simply say it this way. In this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us enough and sent his son to be the propitiation or the payment, the atonement, sufficient for our sins. We don't have to change our life to gain God's love, but when we receive the gifts of God's love, it does the changing for us. We don't have to change to gain God's approval. We don't have to get better, be better, do good enough in order to get into heaven. But when we come to know the truth, the goodness, the depths, the richness of God's grace, mercy, and love, it's life-changing. It changes who we are, how we live, how we go about relationships in our life, everything about us. And that's why Paul continues to write on here to where we would say, finally, that in our life, when we give our life over to Jesus, by grace, through faith, that our aim shouldn't be for being good enough when we do good works. When we come to faith in Christ, when we surrender our life over to him and say, I'm done trying to be good enough and to compensate for my sin because you've done it anyways and you've offered this freely to me, the aim of our life changes. No longer do we have to be good enough and what we do for others to try to find any kind of acceptance between us and the Lord, that's through Jesus. And so it changes the way in which we live our life. Paul will continue on right here in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul, after he came to know Jesus on Damascus Road, which you can read about in Acts chapter 9, just this moment to where uh, Paul's life was changed forever by coming to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he went on to do some pretty incredible things for the church, so much so that we as Christians, as the church today, are thankful because of it, but also look and say, man, like, I want to live like Paul did. I want to live out my faith like that. But the aim of Paul's life switched and it changed. Instead of trying to be Paul that was good enough, Paul instead said, Jesus was good enough for me. He loved me enough to do what he did for me, and now I get to live from his love. I get to live out of the love that God has for me instead of trying to gain it or attain it. These just false hopes can't be good enough, and our aim shouldn't be trying to be good enough when we're doing good works. When we look at these verses... If you've ever wondered about what it takes to enter into that relationship, to feel accepted into heaven, you no longer have to wonder. Like this is how God lets us know how we have a relationship with him, how we, how we enter into a relationship with him, how we are saved. He says, for it's by grace, his grace, through faith. It is through the gracious act of what he has done once and for all in Jesus Christ on the cross and raised from the tomb. And we trust in that. That is as simple as it gets of what salvation is. We never have to wonder how a relationship with God starts. That's baseline. For it is by grace through faith that you're saved. It's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. It's a gift. It's a gift. God gives it to us. You don't earn a gift. You're just given it. 
to live with it. But I say so many times do I stumble back into that thought of trying to be good enough for God, for people, people I work with, my wife, my kids, trying to be good enough, father or husband. So easy for is, is it for me to stumble and just start stepping back into this and letting this thought just overrule my mind to say, man, am I really good enough? What do I got to do to prove myself to this person, that person, my family? It's so easy to digress back into that. And that's why this scripture is so monumental because it's just point blank telling us it's a lie. And living with that kind of motivation in our mind to think that, man, I've got to do X, Y, Z to be good enough for God and to get into heaven. That's what my, my relationship with him is based upon merit is exhausting and super unclear. It's, it's something that it's a bar too high for us to reach and a weight too heavy for us to carry. That's why Jesus did it for us. And so it's a gift that we're given this life, but then in Jesus, in how we do good works out of the love that God has shown us, it's a different disposition. We no longer do it to attain favor from God, but we do it out of the love God has shown us. Matthew chapter 5 through 16 would say it this way. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The reason why this, this aim has to change is because no longer are our good works for us to be good enough and steal the glory from God. When we try to be good enough in order to attain God's favor and to be accepted into God, when that is what it is, what we do for other people has a little bit of a hidden agenda behind it. I'm doing this for you so that I can get into heaven. I'm doing this for you so that God's, God will accept me into a relationship with him and a kingdom for him. It's got some strings attached to it. However, how much more powerful is it to where when we do good unto others, when we serve others, when we care for others, when we, when we do those things, it's just out of selfless love. Hey, no strings attached. I've just come to know this love that Jesus has shown towards me that I didn't deserve. And it's the best thing that has ever happened to my life. And the way in which Jesus lived his, lived his life on earth, he modeled for us. Life is found in him and life is much more about how we give unto others than what we receive from others. And so the love of God changes our life. It changes our aim to no longer try to be good enough through what we do for other people. Instead, our aim becomes showing other people who Jesus is. Letting our light shine before others in a way that points Glory and attention to God, saying this isn't for me. This isn't how good of a person I am. This is just how good Jesus is. And this Paul who is writing this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that's what he went on for the rest of his life to show. It's no longer about me, Paul. It's about Jesus. And so for us in the room, if we have come to know the loving God, if we have been changed by his love, we no longer have to worry about being good enough or doing good unto others so that we meet a standard. We just get to do it out of the freedom and the fullness of God's love in us. So in the way in which we serve people, it's just out of the selfless love of God. This, this word that Paul uses here for workmanship is poiema. This Greek word poiema. And it means a work of art. It's a, it's a piece of art, a sculpture, a painting. And so when you think about a work of art, no work of art does itself, right? Like no work of, no, no painting paints itself, no sculpture sculpts itself. It has an artist behind the work. 
And Paul's using this to say that the way in which we live our life after coming to know Christ should be a way in which we as a sculpt, uh, sculpture, a painting, a work of art points to the artist. That it's not us who gets the glory and the attention, but through us, Jesus is seen in our life. So how we go about serving in our church, how we go about loving others in our job, how we go about wanting to share the gospel with people, how we go about caring for the poor, how we go about going out of our way to do some random act of kindness for somebody, how we go from the simplest things of just being kind to a waiter at a restaurant to the extravagant things of helping somebody financially in need and giving towards them, whatever it is in the realm of good works, it's all out of the love that Jesus has shown us in order to say, it's not about me, it's about him. This is what Jesus would do, and I just want to help bring him glory because he is the best thing that has ever happened to my life. And so for us, it's not about being good enough. If we even remotely think that, we're walking against what God's word is telling us. We're walking against what Paul is saying here the gospel is in Ephesians chapter 2. The gospel simply is this, that even when we were dead in our sin, God loved us enough to make us alive together in Jesus Christ. By grace through faith, we're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross to forever say, I love you, I paid it for you, I want freedom for you, I want fullness for you, I want a relationship with you, and I want to spend eternity with you. And now I want you to just walk with me as my son, as my daughter on earth into heaven. That's what we're called into. So we're not called to be good enough. We're called to Jesus who is good enough for us and just surrender our life over to him. So social tonight, I'm just going to ask you, go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to enter into a time of worship here in a moment. But just in, in, in this time right now, just take some time with the Lord. Take some time with the Lord right now just to really inspect what really drives my life. What's my mindset? Do I think that I have to do this and this and this to be good enough for God? Or is it just Jesus has loved me so much that it has impacted my life. Really dig in with the Lord in a time of prayer. See, what's, what's behind the motivations with which I live? Even take a moment just to Evaluate, maybe go back to that salvation moment if you know and have a relationship with it and just relish in that moment that you went from death to life in Jesus Christ and just give thankfulness to him. Maybe for you right now, it's just a time of being resolute as a Christian and saying, you know what? No longer am I going to be worried about being seen as good enough by people. Instead, I'm just going to soak in the love of Jesus and let that be seen in my life, in my work, in my home, wherever I am. Some of you tonight, you've always felt that weight, and it's never been taken off, that weight of I've got to be good enough, that weight of I've, I've got to get to this level, hit this standard, be perfect. I've got to get better in order for God to accept me. And I would just say, if that's you tonight, that's not what God's saying at all. He says he loves you even while you're dead in sin. He says he has mercy for you and grace ready for you. And all you have to do is trust Jesus. And so if that's you tonight, I would just encourage you. Why don't I have a prayer and decision team in the back with some staff as well, some of our leaders. Go to them. They would love to help you understand how to walk into that relationship with Jesus.
God, thank you so much that you're a good heavenly father that doesn't define our relationship with you based on merit, but you start a relationship with us based upon who you are and the richness of your mercy and your grace and your love. And all you require of us is just to trust you, Jesus. Father, I pray for us in this room that we would just be a force of your love to be reckoned with in the workplace tomorrow, in our homes tonight. God, that we would just want your love to just spill out of us and just to see other people come to know you. God, I pray that your love would just fill people's actions and desires and minds so that way you get all of the glory in our life and how we live and love and treat others. God, I even pray tonight for someone in this room, whoever it is, just to take that step from death into life, to call them out of darkness and just to give their life and surrender over to you. So Jesus, we love you and we worship you because you were enough for us. In your name we pray, Jesus.